Well, <laughs> welcome everybody. This whole thing started uh, last December when I was a guest of Terry Brubaker and the uh, Princeton Club of Hilton Head to uh, enjoy their holiday luncheon. And uh, I remember some exquisite champagne. So in keeping with the long standing tradition in the art world, I encourage you to pretend this is a normal studio tour here and to uh, feel free to imbibe. Uh, it sometimes helps uh, <laughs> and it would probably help at this end. We haven't done this before either. So uh, on behalf of David Chamberlain Studio and of uh, What Can Possibly Go Wrong Productions, uh, I'd like to welcome you and, and introduce uh, a little bit about what's going on here. My associate, Melissa Matson, uh, there she is, will be joining us today as well as Janet Halasinski, I don't know if you can see her hello, or not. Hello, I'm not but, really uh, Behind the scenes, and Larissa Bellavo, who's running the camera. So I should have a mirror for you, I guess. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> anyway, so I'd like to start out by remembering something sophomore year that changed my life. Some of you may recall, uh, I think it was Kleinberg's lecture in Sociology 212. And uh, I remember a, a quote that came from Piaget, and it was something like this, intelligence is what happens when you don't know what to do. And it really uh, struck me because I <laughs> often didn't know what to do, but I knew I wanted to. And uh, that's what we do here in the studio all the time is, is, is try to Put ourselves in that position where what what do we do what would make this better how can we improve this how can we change this how can we flip it upside down and turn it inside out and make it into something that's new and rewarding the uh the guy from yale joseph albers a well-known painter uh, had another quote that influenced my life and that is the measure of art is the ratio of effort to effect point being that if you can reduce something to essence, if you can make that exquisite note or that virtuoso line, then that's what we do best as human beings. And that's what we like to share with other people. So we have somebody from Princeton and somebody from Yale. I was hoping to do something from Harvard or for at least Oxford and Cambridge, but uh, instead I've decided to do something from myself having gone to none of those places. But I'd like to be remembered for this quote, which is, perception is its own reward. And if you think about that, it's another reason why we're here today. That if we're open to seeing things and experiencing new things and going to new places, then we become pioneers and we tend to reap the rewards at the end of the journey. Otherwise, we miss the journey and we miss the reward. So. From that point, I'd like to walk you around the studio a little bit. Most of the implements here are hand wrought instruments. These are designed to make it as hard as possible to uh, do it right. But when you do do it correctly and beautifully and well, it's masterful and it's magical. So let me put some gloves on here. To uh, Larissa's right is <laughs> some of the some of the uh, the tools of the trade. Lots and lots of pigments, and it's all oil paint. But I try to make oil paint do what it wasn't designed to do, keeping with my maxim of always take the harder road and push the boundaries. Moving to the left, you can see rollers. We have rollers of different lengths here and different diameters. We even have a large one that we'll be using later, I think, that's about this big around. And you wouldn't think that a roller could be a complicated uh, thing, but it's like a musical instrument where, you know, a weekend to uh, learn and a lifetime to master. There are all kinds of ways to work these rollers. And, uh, We'll set something up here and see what we can do. If you follow what I'm doing, 
Every roller is a printing press. I can repeat exactly a visual image. So I can do this, pick it up, and repeat it. So there's a strong medium and light repeat of that original image. So if we transfer a bunch of this paint to this light table, we can switch to Cindy's camera. And Overhead camera would be great to see that. You can hear the hiss. I think you can probably hear the hiss from the rolling. If I roll, absolutely, speeds, you get a different effect. If I twist it or roll at an angle, you get a different effect. If I roll on the edges, you get a different effect. I can do all kinds of things just from sensing and feeling the feedback from the roller and the viscosity of the paint. This is hissing a little bit, so the paint is a little thick, but it'll suit our purposes pretty well. The other thing we do once we've transferred images with the rollers onto our painting plate, is a lot of work by hand. So if you can see what I'm doing, I'm gonna turn this light on and see if we can get away with this. Now you can see all kinds of stuff in the paint. If I turn the light off, you kind of miss that. That's the opaque thing we're used to. But I discovered that by, these are trade secrets here, that by seeing the light through the canvas instead of against it, I can form these wonderful nuances and learn more about what's going on with the paint. There are lots of ways to make marks. And again, like playing a musical instrument, if you use your fingers and your, your sense of touch, you can hear things squeak, you can feel the paint fight, you can add a little thumbnail or not. Everything you do with your fingers is variations on a theme because each finger is a different length and strength, thickness. So there are a lot of ways to make elegant marks. I don't know if you could see that one, but parallels, variations on a theme, more variations on a theme. So I'll just cover this again. So we have all these options. And that's the whole idea is to have so many possibilities, you're overwhelmed with the potential of the whole concept. Yeah. So how do you turn this into a composition? I was just going to ask, what, do you, what, do, what does this lead to? We have oil paint on glass. So how do you turn that into the arch? Well, we're going to work today with two strange colors, orange and black. Partly because everybody in the art world says you can't paint with orange. They're very finicky pigments. And partly because of course, that's a good reason to try to do it. So for the last couple of years, I've been trying this orange and black series. and now have about a hundred uh, finished compositions. And I'd like to share with you what happens with only two colors. And you can imagine multiplying that into hundreds and hundreds of colors. But for our purposes, we will, Start with the paint on a plate. The paint is oil. We will put it on through a press with uh, wet paper. Since the water resists the oil, it doesn't smear or bleed. It just makes a clear, crisp print. And if we do everything properly, we can transfer all the oil and the paint pigments onto the paper. And then we have uh, a reverse image but we also have a finished painting. The advantage is we have these wonderful, wonderful, fine opportunities for elegant tuning and very subtle lines and gestures. And you can never get that with, with a brush. So even though like most artists, I was trained using brushes and developing that nice impasto gooey you know, color over color over color, I like this because I can sculpt the paint. I can give it a kind of a density and a, a dimension that otherwise uh, you don't get with flat work. I didn't really answer the question. No, I, I'm, I, I wonder if our audience is wondering what this leads up to, an actual 
print of this art, right? Well, all around me, and Larissa can pan across the studio, are glass tables. And every one of those tables is a palette. Oh, uh, sure. So I'll grab a little of this paint while Melissa's cleaning things off. Wander over to the left, and we'll start something. I don't know if you can see this, but. We'll start something as a background. So the orchestra has shown up. We have to determine which musical instruments we're going to use. In this case, <laughs> orange and black. And if we can put a plate on here. Oh, okay. Orange is a very tricky Let's see. Bear with me a moment. We've moved things around here a little bit. So I should introduce Melissa while we're doing this. I've uh, worked with other artists from all over the world. And Hi, I'm Melissa. Oh, I'm, I'm reintroduced Melissa. <laughs> right. Um, shall I say something about how we met? Oh, uh, sure. So, um, I'm a professional musician. I've been a violist in the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra, um, principal viola for several decades. And in the meantime, I started working on fabric dyeing and mono prints. So I was doing similar work to what you saw David do, but I was doing it fabric dyes and printing fabric. So when David contacted me to do these collaborations, it was sort of magic. So I'm not a real artist, but I play one on TV. <laughs> well, the nice thing about working with musicians is they're used to performing live, partly because of the thrill of it. There's no place to hide. And partly because of the risk. You know, you can go down in the blaze of glory, which sometimes we do. So, so David has prepared two plates, which he's now going to... Great art. Oh, I'm going to make one of something here. I remember the first time I heard harmony. I was singing a song with my dad in the car, and all of a sudden he was singing the same song, but there was this strange effect. And I thought, boy, you know, I want to, I want to learn how to do that. So I remember uh, going to a funeral service for an a cappella singer at Princeton. And after about the fifth or sixth hymn, somebody stood up in the front and turned around and said, for God's sake, somebody please sing the melody. And it said it all. The point was that it's so much more fun doing the harmony and that, that crazy buzz you get when you're, you're fighting the melody and enhancing it rather than just singing it. So, in terms of playing beyond the score, that's what we'll try to do here. So here's the background. Oh, let's see, what would be good? Let me swipe some paint here. And this is a horizontal now. Okay, there we go. That's better. So we now have a starting point. Somebody walked into the uh, auditorium, hummed a few bars, and now it's us, up to us to uh, see if we can do something with it. Oh, yeah, because you take Okay, here we go. So I don't know if you can see it, but that's one view. Here's another view. It's better just like this, right there. 
we've been experimenting okay. with this. The, the normal way that they would work is to have the light underneath the table coming up through the glass, but it doesn't work on cameras. So what would turn this into a, a real composition? Based on what we see here, we can we can take lines that already exist, maybe run a real risk with more black. <laughs> it's a little thick. If you could defend that, thank you. Ah, that's better. So I'd like to add something lighter now. You can see we're starting to get this buildup and this richness in the background. The orange isn't as strong as it could be, but that's the thing about orange. I'm looking for this. Okay. Contrasting element. Counter element. We need something here. Now, if this is a Western culture, we'll make it a horizontal that goes, ends up in the bottom left-hand corner, so we'll head for the bottom right-hand corner. We have this wonderful open space here. All it needs is just one. We can have you be louder, please. Oh, okay. So anyway, let's try that as an experiment. We'll now print it and try to make all that paint come off onto the paper and still retain every little nuance that feels like paint. This is an etching press, plain old standard etching press that you can get anywhere. But of course, typically we don't, we don't use it for etching. Okay. To, to re-say that, this, this is an etching press. You can start to see it appearing here. And the whole idea is to impart even uniform pressure across the plate and really force the paint into the resisting wet paper. So I'm going to reach into this stack of French handmade paper, reputed to have been made by the same company, Cancel Montgolfier, that make the Magna Carta. So we're lucky to have this option. I'm just checking to make sure that the uh, watermark is in the right place. As you can see, it's almost like pizza dough. And you can probably see some of the water on it. And if the paper is soaked with just the right amount, toward me a little, there we go. And the paint is just the right viscosity and the Roller is just the right speed and the pressure is just right and it is a quarter moon and not too windy. We should be able to transfer everything. So normal number nine. So very thick felt, right? Right. They're buffering the, the pressure. Now on the second run through, we're picking up that last 10 or 15 percent of the detail. And that's what makes this special. Because again, uh, you can try and try, but brushes just don't quite have that potential. Okay. David, if you want to get on so, this side. Okay. So I'm not sure how this is going to look, but at least it's a start and it'll give you a feel for what happens. I don't know if you can see the orange. Let's bring it over anyway, there. it's a horizontal, so here's what it's supposed to look like. And there's always that question of, you know, the athlete who wins the game in the last three seconds with a foul shot or a, or a jump shot, or the place kicker who, you know, wins the championship with one kick and the last play of the game, and everybody says, wow. He makes 
24 kicks a season and makes $24 million. That's a million dollars a kick. That's pretty good. And the same thing here. People could say, well, you know, it takes a half an hour to make a painting. But in reality, this is really 30,000 attempts. We've run about 30,000 30, individual compositions through this press over the years. Hopefully you can begin to see the interplay, the repetition, the variations on a the theme, the background, and ideally you can hear different, different sounds. You can hear the timbre of percussion here. You can, you can feel that smoothness of the violin solo. And you can see the richness of all these horns. And it makes a composition. So this might be a good time for some questions while we set things up for the next phase here. <laughs> or not. Uh, Do you play an instrument? Uh, yes, I am a vocalist. And uh, I used to play the trumpet and I played just enough piano to be dangerous. <laughs> But the thing I liked about it is, you know, the trumpet, you can only get one note. The piano, you can get way too many notes. And then the voice, uh, you can be part of a, a group of notes. In this case, uh, I often sing with quartets because you get a, a good range of harmony, but at the same time, there is no place to hide. So I like that. I also have three brothers, so we were a quartet. And I uh, sang on the amateur hour as a little kid and as a quartet, a folk quartet. And uh, we used to run track at Princeton and uh, the Maya Relay was a quartet. So there's something about the magic of twos and fours and eights and sixteens that uh, has always uh, led me astray. So at this point, the beauty of the improvisational nature of, of this technique is that who you are comes out in the painting and your backgrounds, your thoughts, your ideas. If, if two people work together on the same painting at the same time, after a while, we, we open up little trap doors and we can see into each other's minds. I'm looking at, at Melissa's thought bubble. She's trying to, to find mine and we're trying to find ways to, to put them together in a new thing, a new direction that will go someplace different than what we would have done ourselves individually. So go ahead. It sounds like you. Oh, I was just I saw your thought bubble up. There. My my thought bubble was going to say that that it's interesting to look at the relationship between music and improvisation and chamber music and the sorts of things that I've done in the music world and to interact with another artist to try to do that improvisation and have it printed. So it's a little scary. Um, as David says, sometimes the magic works with each gesture, there's potential uh, for both success and failure. But I think it's been wonderful over the last several years for us to experiment with how we work together. So I think we're about to start a pair of duets. So we'll uh, each work on something bouncing back and forth. Uh, the idea is that. Uh, she knows what I know, that she knows what I know, that she knows what I know. And if she makes a mark, it gives me an idea. It's like trading apes in jazz. So. And we often try to make sure that what you want to I was going to do. Huh? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I called her bluff. That's wonderful. Okay. So that's a start. What that does is it. It starts with real texture and, and a really wonderful set of designs. So I'm going to start something different over here. I can't look. Uh, let's see here. So the beauty of this is this will trigger something. Synapses, good things bouncing around visually. And I'm wondering, does it give her the same ideas it gives me? If it does, then we're off and running as a, a duo. If it doesn't, then I'm gonna learn something because she may come up with something better than what I had imagined. And so there's this interplay back and forth that 
gradually you, you learn about each other and you learn about the way another person thinks. Oh, it's going to be great. Oh, yeah. Okay. Briefly, we'll take a look and see what colors come through. Now, there's another piece to the puzzle that we've waited until now to to discuss with you, and that is the mirrors overhead. If you're working on an easel, you can stand back, you can look at it and get an objective perspective on it. We're painting flat, so we don't have that opportunity. But the way we can get around that is we can see it up from a distance now, from above. We can see it rotated 90 degrees left or 90 degrees right, all without having to move. So. Ooh, that's a nice mark. Wasn't that nice? I yeah, took it from yeah. what was left from that. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if we even need more orange on this. Hmm. Or maybe we do. Yeah, we do. Just that corner. So one thing that was fascinating to me when I first started doing this was that each time the roller goes across the plate, it both puts down paint and picks up paint. So that's how we can transfer things from one plate to another and make the magical make the magical uh, harmonies as you mentioned. I'm tempted just to just to see what would happen if everybody played together. And I think I ruined it. So I'll go back and pick up your original mark and see what I can. Oh, did you have, let me just try to save it here. Ah, okay. It's a good example of uh, when you get to that make it or break it point where can you save it and really do something new? Deliberately try to, to change the discussion or do you wipe it off and say, take two? Okay. So I'm starting to see this as a set of boxes. And if we're going on horizontal, we should bring it. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, it makes it so different. <laughs> yeah, it's hard, this, hard to see. It just needs a, a melody line or something. A melody yeah, line. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure we can save this one, but that's okay. It's, it's good to, it's to make mistakes in public. So. Yeah. Well, I like you never that. know until it's printed. Well, that's true. Okay, let's what each make a melody print? line. Okay. Make a what? Um, here. You can do that one and I'll... I'll Figure out something. Oh, did you want to use that one here? No, I was going to use the blue, the little blue wedge. Here we go. Thank you, Jack. Let's see. So I'm looking at looking in the mirrors to see where the top and the bottom are with abstract, non-representational art. It's not always clear. Oh yeah, I'm I'm hiding from you here. With work that's not representational, it's it's a challenge to sometimes have it make compositional sense. So keep your eye on Melissa's painting. <laughs> it's a duet. It's not my painting. <laughs> no, but it's the one that we should be looking at. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, that light. I do. 
bring some things out. I liked those two verbs there. You think this could use a gesture in there? Yeah, it's pretty it's thick. Really nice. Pretty thick. Yeah. Hmm. There are days when we <laughs> we don't make anything that's any good for the whole day. Then there are other times when we make, you know, three in a row and drink champagne. I'll be curious to see what we do on this one. How do you decide what is good and what is not? Uh, I heard a question, but I couldn't hear it loudly. How do you decide what is good and what is not? That's the perfect question. David? I asked Melissa. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, there's a language in a lexicon. And uh, sometimes it's a technical question, but most of the time it's, uh, it's, it's about the language of composition. Just like how can you tell uh, one version of O oh, Susanna from another, or uh, and especially uh, the difference between uh, Mr. Jones's third grade band and, and you know the Boston Symphony Orchestra playing the same piece. So we we have to decide. You have to uh, think that you know. Uh, but you're right. If it's abstract, it's not like it looks like your Aunt Bertha. Uh, so. This is something that we really wrestle with because in our mind's eyes, everything is abstract. Music is completely abstract. It doesn't really exist in any tangible form. And yet we get it. We get the patterns and the relationships. So I'd like to think that there's a visual version of that same thing. I think that for, for me, I look for a balance. Um, if if there's, if... So for me, um, oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I I think of it in terms of balance. Uh, you can see an, an overbearing gesture that needs to be made more subtle. Uh, if there's a, a a relationship between elements that makes sense to me, uh, sometimes the colors don't work for me. So when something's good, it doesn't have to be beautiful, but I think it has to be meaningful and to resonate. Um, and different things will resonate with different people, just like different compositions. Mm -hmm. Some people can't stand the music of Bach, but other people love it as I do because of, of its, its balance, its cohesion. Um, I also love the music of Bartok, which is similarly cohesive, but in different ways. So. I think that we can all look at a piece of art. We can all look at a piece of art and say, I, that resonates with me. This mark resonates with me, this gesture, um, even if I can't describe it. Well, and that's why we are attracted to variations on the theme. You know, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, positive, negative or positive, negative. So there's a rhythm there. There's something going on here where without this mark, it's not the same. With that mark, you jump right over to the other side of the painting. And then you say, oh, wait a minute. Maybe these two are the same as these two, but they're 90 degrees off. And then maybe this is part of that shadow image, that little ghost there. Maybe that balances this. And then you start to have a, co a cohesive uh, conversation. Shall I print this? Um, I think it needs a little more black. But I would. I Do you usually that. agree on what's good? <laughs> That's an interesting question. And no, we don't always agree on what's good. Now, for example, the marks that David just made to me are nicely balanced. He took, had this gesture originally, and then this one he made very elegantly, also an improvisation, but balances the direction of the other one. That to 
to me, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think it's ready to print now, unless you want to do uh, um, something. No, I think we'll go for real with that. Okay, because this is a pure painting. It doesn't really have a melody line, but that's right. nice. Well, it's wait, a nice. I will add a melody line. Uh oh, a melody line. All right, and this is uh, horizontal. So mm -hmm. often we have to check with each other <laughs> to say which side do you think is down. So right. David? Well, and at about the two-thirds stage, we have to determine the orientation. It really makes a difference. And now I'm seeing <laughs> I'm seeing this differently. Mm. Boy, it wants to be a vertical. Well, you can fix that with a melody line. Yeah. So I was thinking of going down to that corner. Yep. Yeah. All right. sure. Can you tell us what you mean by a melody line? So um, I'll tell you what I I mean by it is that this looks like it's um, it's a beautiful background. It has textures underneath it. It has a few elements here, but nothing that sort of pops out and says, this is what I want you to focus on, or this is what I want you to really notice. Um, being a viola player, I appreciate the inner voices and you can't have a successful melody without what happens underneath. So, um, David, do you wanna no. add to that? <laughs> no, that was well said. So what I'm thinking in terms of the Western tradition of aiming towards what will eventually be the lower right corner, I'm going to make a gesture that will bring us, bring the eye down to that. Um, and I tend to, in my own fabric work and my own artwork, I'm, um, I'm taken by the use of script, calligraphy, text. So I tend to make gestures which remind us of writing. So I will try to add something in here that will bring us that idea. A little bit too much in the center for me, but. So I'll see your melody and raise you a melody. All right. All right, let's see. And again, we talked about lines before. Here's a case, I don't know if you can see this, but I'll hold it up to this camera. Uh, you may be able to see the subtlety. There we go, thank you. You may be able to see the subtlety of the melody line where it's changing character all along. It, it, it changes character so much that as it comes up here, it jumps away and we connect it again, of course, because that's how our vision works. But everything is always in transition. So it's a line worth looking at, following. I have one more line I want to make. One okay, more line I want to make. okay. Then I'll take this over while you do it because I can't watch. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm coming back. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm just going to make one more mark that'll hopefully bring the eye down to this mm -hmm. corner. And I've added a little orange on it. So it's a little percussion. Yeah. And again, when we print it, you'll see that there are little tiny orange dots at the ends of some of this arpeggiation. Okay. okay. So we have one on the press. We'll rotate. So here we are back at the press. We go through a lot of gloves. <laughs> <laughs> if any little bit of paint on your fingers you can get onto the plate here and pick up on the paper. And uh, we don't want that. So when we finish this, it'll look a little better when it's dry a little more vivid, and it'll show us what's really going on. Yeah. Yep, that's it, okay. But uh, it's also possible to retouch these things, to get rid of dust spots, to add a little nuance here and there, and that can really make it ring. So it takes maybe another two hours to finish this up. Okay, number nine. We're gonna print these two. Uh -oh. we just. 
Oh, thank you. Crumple control. Thank you, Doc. Ah, collaboration. Okay, let's keep an eye on that spot. There we go. Okay. So it's feeling a little light. Um, I was worried that the paint was drying, but I think we're okay. Yeah, let's go a little past full. Like, yeah. Yep, that matches. Okay. And you'll feel the pressure. And it'll pop when it jumps off the plate. Okay. Thank you. So here's number two. You want to open your hands up? That's okay. I've got it. Okay. So I'll walk it over to the easel. It's kind of wet and floppy. Do the colors change much as it dries? Uh, yes, they become a little more vivid. It's a great question. And what uh, what is nice about it is this transition right here, if you can see my finger, is, is brilliant and then it softens and softens. It's barely there, but the transition is beautiful. The same here, same there, and there. That's a gorgeous pair of transitions. And that's fine. what's the normal drying time, David? It's about um, in the winter here with the, the heat on, it's about a week. In the summer, it's about two weeks. And then uh, it, you have to flatten them too because this is an organic substance and so it will absorb the water and expand and then as it dries, it shrinks about 2%. David, do you have a special filtration system to keep the dust out of the studio? Uh, <laughs> no, but I vacuum a lot and we wipe everything down ruthlessly. I, it's more of a laboratory than a studio in that respect. But uh, you can see a dust spot there and a dust spot there. And that's about it. This is a pretty clean print, but of course, by the end of the day, it gets, uh, by the end of the day, <laughs> it gets a little. I mean, that's so, what I was thinking. Yeah. And, and sometimes we have very long days. Cindy, by any chance, are you YouTubing this? Uh, yes, we are recording this and we'll make the link available uh, by YouTube. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, we'll send that around to everyone who participated. Oh, I think we can share it with the whole club because there's some people who couldn't join us at this yes. time. So we'll make sure the club has it. And if those, am I unmuted? Um, and if um, those of you in Rochester or, or anybody else would like it, just let us know. But everyone who was here plus the club. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether or not some other artists on Hilton Head would be interested in seeing it. Okay, so. I think Terry invited, didn't Terry invite some other Hilton Head artists? Terry, are you here? I, I, I saw you signed in. I didn't hear back. Oh, okay. But Terry has great contacts in the arts community. He may be able to share the link. That looks beautiful on the black. Yes. Yeah, that one little range of black, you know, uh, that one spot helps to to run the full gamut of from light to dark of that color or hue. And the same as all these tones of gray, we have the bright orange, we have the softness as it turns into gold and, and the little brown. And then the same is true for the black becoming that kind of warm brown, almost into nothingness. How many prints can you make from one plate? Can you only make one print? That is the essential question. And the answer is only one. If you do it right, all of the paint or 99% of it comes off from the plate onto the paper. So the plate, the plate, there's not enough left on the plate to do anything more. And that's why they call it a monotype. It's a one shot deal. So this is an original one of a kind painting. And it brings up an interesting point. When these go to art museums, it's fun because the, the different curators fight over domain. They'll say, well, this is marks made by hand on paper, so clearly it's a drawing. And then the painting curator will say, oh no, it's an original one of a kind oil painting. It's in my domain. And the graphics person will say, oh no, you can see it's been run through an etching press. 
there's the embossing. And so it's really a little bit of everything and nobody knows what to call them. And to further confuse the issue, when we show these, Melissa and I both sign them. So <laughs> there's no attribution to one particular artist. And we love the fact that a lot of curators in a lot of museums uh, still scratch their heads over what to do with these things. But the important thing is they collect them. <laughs> How about uh, other questions? Now's a good time. David, uh, can you say something about your international uh, collaborations and the, uh, the effect of, of having different languages? Uh, sure. The, um, <laughs> I, I flunked most of the languages I studied. Uh, including Japanese at Princeton. And uh, so I had a special interest in other cultures. And you may recall that in the, the 60s and 70s, the two issues of the time were the Vietnam War and apartheid. And so Princeton in the nation's service and humanity. Uh, fast forward a few years later, and I had the opportunity in 1995 to be the first American artist to do a cultural exchange with Vietnam. And in fact, we set it up just prior to reestablishing diplomatic relations. So I had to meet with their de uh, State Department and our State Department in Canada uh, in, in order to, in, in Ottawa, in order to set everything up. When I returned, uh, there was an exhibition of the work that I did with Vietnamese artists and musicians and poets and dancers uh, at the Delaware Art Museum. And, as uh, my trusty studio assistant from Vietnam was getting off the plane, we were signing uh, the rapprochement with Vietnam and the Rose Garden. So that was, a, that was a meaningful thing. And two years later, I had the chance to be one of the, the first non-Black artists to work with artists in South Africa during the, uh, the riddance of apartheid and the institution of their new uh, constitution. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I did not speak any of the languages. And we didn't need to because everybody I worked with was a musician. So we used mostly musical terms and, and metaphors uh, to understand each other and to work together. We made a lot of duet paintings, including some in front of a group of Princetonians who were on one of the uh, Princeton Journeys programs in South Africa at that time. So, um, in, in this East-West thing, I did a lot of paintings with Yuji Kishimoto and with Emi Tajima. Emi was the first uh, or the youngest master level calligrapher at the time in Japan. And she liked working together because she was free. If she worked with me, she didn't have to spell everything correctly. You know, we could make any kind of a, a gesture or a mark that we wanted because it was beautiful, not because it was the way it was supposed to look uh, in script. And I liked working with her because she taught me to be careful. Uh, Amy had this way of vision, uh, envisioning things and she would, she would replay it and draw sketches and make it fast and make it slow, make it big, make it small, take a deep breath. And when she was ready, she would make the perfect mark. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing to know. David, are any of these orange and black series in the Princeton Art Museum? Uh, I think a couple, they have five of my paintings. And uh, the Orange and Black series though is pretty new. They're aware of them. Um, I don't know the answer. I know that, uh, uh, no, I, I, I just don't know. There seems are some that seems appropriate. Well, there are precursors to these that they did collect. Hmm. Um, and some of the images you saw uh, at the beginning of the program uh, are similar to the ones that are in the Princeton Art Museum collection. Mm -hmm. Hey, David, it's Terry. Can you hear me? Hi, hey, Terry. How are you? Good, um, good. Uh, you, you started this whole thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Lord about it. Do you, do you paint in music? You seem to describe your work in music. You think in music? Uh, yes, I can't help it. Um, sometime in freshman year, I discovered that the reason all my friends uh, went to concerts uh, 
wasn't to see all the visual images, it was to hear the music. <laughs> to me, I thought the music was the images. And I, you know, I always saw visual images when I saw dance, when I listened to music, when I read poetry. And so there's some quirky thing, I guess it's synesthesia in a sense. And uh, when I'm painting, I hear the music from what I'm doing. I don't hear the music in the background. I just hear what's in front of me taking shape. Uh, I don't know how that works, <laughs> but uh, maybe I should donate my body to science or something. <laughs> when you draw the at melody least, line, are you hearing the tones? <laughs> at least the paintings. Uh, <laughs> I was I was just wondering if there was any feedback from our audience on the three paintings that were created during this hour. So there's the the one solo that David did, and then our two duets. I don't know, Cindy, if you want to kind of run something like that, or well, I I think um, we could take half a minute because uh, so we're heading towards the end of our hour. And if everyone goes to gallery view, if you know how to find that on your screen. We could do a little vote and see um, what people thought. Did people like the first one that David did that was a solo piece? Um, did they respond well to the duet? So I thought maybe if we can start by um, putting the camera on the first one, those who responded really well to that, do you want to just put up your hand and we'll, we'll see what everybody thought? I have to put my hand, get my hand to the so. so. You. Okay, rotate. For those, of us with bad, with, for those of us with bad memories, can we see all three? <laughs> <laughs> or you can put your hand up for all three. Exactly. Well, we, we burn all but one. So, <laughs> so if you want to, um, Melissa, may, or Larissa, if you want to zoom in on one, you can. if you guys are in gallery, you should see her uh, zooming the camera around. So here's one. So let's just see a show of hands for those who respond well to oh, where's the hand things. No, no, just look literally raise Oh, we're hands. literally raise our hands. <laughs> the virtual hand. hands. Yeah. So you can raise a hand if you like this one. All right. So we got one. I think I would say that's a, a pretty healthy majority, it looks like. We're only allowed to vote once, is that right? <laughs> How about you with both vote, hands? You can vote any as many times oh, as you Oh, okay. Want. I didn't know that. I thought we could vote. <laughs> then we my have hand went for the first one too. Here it is. All right. How are, how about the second one? Is that the second one here with with the uh the rhythm line at the bottom? Uh everybody, people who respond well to yeah, that. Yeah, it's really absolutely. interesting. And then the third one, we can zoom in. I think this looks like a reunion jacket at the end of <laughs> the weekend. <laughs> Everything looks like a reunion jacket. But... That's true. Exactly. And those who, who are intrigued by this one, and, and I will admit, yeah. I'm, I'm all three. I find this yeah. style so fascinating. Okay. Um, and so, David, we're so grateful for you and, and for this time we've had with everyone. And I, I think we're at our, our wrap up moment here. So thank you all for coming. We had a wonderful time. It's so good to get together, even if it's virtual. It's just so great to remember that we share being part of Princeton and our connection to each other. And so many thanks to David, to his um, team, to Melissa, to everyone who worked so hard to make this happen. Again, I want to thank Cindy, who worked very hard for this. And what we would finally like to do is something the university has made possible. We have a recording of Old Nassau, so we can end our meetings like we always do. So thank you, and goodbye, everyone. We'll see you in November. Bye-bye.